Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for this opportunity we get to rejoice in what Jesus has done. And God, I do pray that this would be a message that is memorable, um, Father, but also that this is an opportunity for us to lean in and thank you. God, I pray that we wouldn't be distracted. I pray that we would be kind and courteous to our neighbors as we engage with your word. And Father, that in all things you would receive glory from us. I pray in Jesus' name. All right, Luke, Luke chapter 19, I'd like you to find verse 37. Verse 37. For context, here's what's happening. Jesus is about to enter into Jerusalem on a colt. And here's what it says, starting in verse 37. When he came near to the place where the road goes down from the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God and loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And in verse 38, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. While, while I'm breaking down some of this, if you can go ahead and flip to Psalm 150. I was trying to think of titles for this, and I think one of the best things I could share with you is, is this. Here's the message boiled down. You and I were created to praise. You and I were created for a specific, very specific purpose. But I do love this picture of Jesus humbly coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. And these Pharisees are rebuking the disciples who are saying, oh, my goodness, look at what God is doing through Jesus. This is amazing. And Jesus said, if you try to make them quiet, the stones will sing out. And since we're on the topic of singing today, uh, I'd really like to do my best to right some wrongs, if you will. There are a lot of misconceptions associated with singing in the church, and, and I blame a lot of TV for that, but that's unrelated. But here's the question. Were you to be silent tonight? Were you to resist giving God praise? Would the stones around you sing out? And I just wonder, because there's something so powerful, something so important that happens when you and I make a noise together bigger than ourselves. But let's get into this. There's a question that must be asked. And I don't mean this in this existential, oh my goodness, what am I? But here's the question. What was I created to do and what was I created to be? Well, let's read Psalm 150 and then I'm going to give you my bias. It says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Here's what I know to be true. There are some very old dead guys who said the, the chief end of man is to know God and enjoy him forever. I think that's a really, really powerful thing to chew on. But if I could boil this down and make it even simpler, you were created to praise the God who made you. What is the purpose of my life? I know Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, I'm saved by grace through faith, not of works that any man shall boast. I always love keying in on verse 10 that says, we're God's handiwork in Christ Jesus, created to do good works which he prepared for us in advance. Right, hopefully you've heard this so many times. But if I could boil this down, everything that has breath is called to praise the Lord, praise the Lord. The book of Psalms is compiled over about a thousand year period. And how does this set of books end in the book of Psalms? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord with every instrument you can think of, with every posture you can take, in every possible place God would have you. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So you and I were created to praise the God of the universe. And here's what I want to do, because what happens is this. You get to youth group, you check in, you get what you need, and then all of a sudden we come in here at about 6.15 and we sweat and we sing together. But here's what I wonder sometimes, because I've been doing music ministry for a very long time, is I see more often than not a couple specific things happen. It's happened to me in big church, and I have some stories that a couple people know that are really awkward, but they know them. But sometimes as a person on this side of the stage looking out at you, I see a couple specific things, and I'm going to move over here a little bit. You will see the people who do this. For the power that grace you. You'll see the people that do this one. You'll see the, the cup holder. And then sometimes you'll see the people that are just amazed that there's a TV on the back screen that is the same thing that you're seeing right here. And, so, and we get so distracted. We get so distracted. That one's actually really funny because there's a couple of you unrelated. Um, but, but here's the thing. Music has always played a very big role in my life. We just go back from CIY, 
And I can still remember where I sat when I felt called to go into ministry. And it was Wolf Pelsu played his songs. And it's like, wow, like these big moments. But for me, I have a lot of major life decisions that were tied to music. The first time I ever went to a church of my own free will, the first thing that stood out to me was Ryan Stockton up on the drums, drumming along to You Never Let Go by Matt Redman. I remember some of the sermon. remember some of the sermon. It was Book of Jonah. But what I really remember is being encapsulated by there's Jesus rock music, if you will. Like, wow, like I really like this. I'm drawn to this. And I wonder if sometimes you and I, because of some of the stereotypes and some of the things we'll try to deal with, we miss the power of music and how God has used it to bless his church and maybe reach you in a way that a sermon never could. Because I don't want this to be, there's a time of praise and there's a time of preaching. I want there to be this understanding that in the Bible, it's one dominant thing, whether it's done through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, or whether it's done with a Bible in front of you and an iPad in this 21st century day and age. But the fuel, I said something about fuel. Here's what happens. You get in here, you get checked in, you get your coffee, whatever, and you might take the awkward by the power that raised you. But I think the thing that changes this from a performance into a participative act where we're together is fuel for the fire. And so what I want to do is I have a series of things I've written down, um, a series of things I've written down and then ask me about some of the misconceptions. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to do an exercise. I've written down a series of things God has done in the past 4,000 years. And you'll say he did after I read it. Here's the first one. When God's people had been enslaved for 400 years, he used a man, and this man led them out, and then the Red Sea was parted, and thus God's people escaped slavery into freedom in the wilderness. And you're going to say, God did, or he did. He did. Thank you. Here's the next one. After walking around Jericho for seven days with the blast of a trumpet and a shout, the, wall, the walls of Jericho fell. <laughs> he did. <laughs> All right, so remember... Daniel's friends, they're thrown into a furnace. Or what happens? They don't burn up. Why? Because there was a fourth man in the fire. He did. he did. God did. Thank you. Elijah at Mount Carmel finds himself in this contest with like 200 priests of Baal. And all day they slash themselves. And all day, great is Baal, great is Baal. And Baal never shows up because he's a dead God that doesn't exist. But Elijah prays, God be glorified. And God consumes the sacrifice. He did. Well, we'll do God did. It makes a little bit more sense. Okay, we're finding our way here. Okay, here, here's a big one. In Jesus' day, there were mute men who were healed and could speak. There were men who were raised from tombs and came back to life. There were men in spiritual captivity whom demons held down, and Jesus ripped them out. Thank you. The chief end, here it is, right? This is the core of the gospel. Jesus lived a perfect life. He was betrayed by his closest friends. He was tortured and hung on a cross, and he died. But three days later, he rose. God, God did. Thank you. Okay, here, here's it. Let's tie this into our story, right? For 2,000 years since Jesus came, men and women have restored marriages, God, have mended broken relationships, God, have broken racial and social disparities, God, and have found a life-changing relationship because of Jesus. This is the power of God, and that's done. That exercise is done. I want to remind you, here's the fuel. This is who God is, and this is what he's done, and that is the reason we sing. And, and if I could give you the silliest example for my sports fans in the room, when your team scores a touchdown or you pass the test, what typically happens? Like, yes! What I want you to get is this. When we sing together, it's not just because we have to sing, and then there's a sermon, and then there's communion and small groups. We get to do this because it's a privilege and a pleasure and we respond to what God is and what he has done. And he has, received, he has revealed himself brilliantly in the passages of scripture. And even in your own life, if you claim to be a Christian, God shows up and he works and he moves and he changes. And hopefully when you come together and you're singing the song about how the risen one is overcome, how he's broken strongholds, whatever it is, there's fuel to the fire because you actually have substance to the lyrics. Does this make sense? Because you're able to say, I know how he did that in my life. And this isn't just theoretical. This is testimony. This is personal for me. And I'm hot on this because I asked you to remind me. Uh, misconceptions. I've been in music ministry for a little over a decade. And I think here's the problem with the American church. This is the hot take. Everything is viewed in the light of consumerism. Well, they didn't sing songs we liked. I remember a few years ago getting in an argument with someone when I was a music minister, and they said, you got to stop singing those old songs. You gotta, it's got to be two years or younger, basically. Stop singing those old songs. They're pathetic. You're not going to reach people when you sing a song from 2006. 
And I had people tell me these things, like, get rid of this. Why? Because it's what I wanted. It's about my preference. Or maybe here's a big one. Turn down the lights. Let me have my one-on-one -on -one moment communing with God as I sing him praises. Uh, Dr. Bill Wolf, one of my professors in college, said something that will stick with me for the rest of my life. He said one of the biggest issues in the American church on a Sunday morning is a thousand individual worship services. And so what happens, and we'll see this when we go to Colossians 3.16, people have this tendency to, when they come to church, it's all about me, myself, and I, which means when the praise team gets up and leads us in a song, it better be one I like, because this is my moment with Jesus. Forget the person to my right and my left. Forget anything else. It's all about me. And it's the same thing when you come around the tables of communion. Well, it's all about just me. When, when someone greets you or gives you coffee, it's all about me. And because of that, overwhelmingly, I watch participation when it comes to singing in the local church dwindle. Now, there are some people that will say, well, I don't want to sing the Jesus is my boyfriend songs. Look, me either, dude, I'm with you. That's why we don't sing Jesus is my boyfriend songs. I think they're disturbing. But I think we have a, um, I think we have missed the point of singing. And maybe, maybe you're like most people, well, I don't sing anywhere else in life. And when it does come to singing, I watch America's Got Talent or, or any of those other things. And you, and you're expected to have this perfect sound. You're like, what if my voice cracks? What if I come in early and I miss the song when the band's going and then someone laughs? Like, there are a lot of things that happen. But can I, can I remind you, singing is the only time in a service when all of us actively participate verbally. Other than that, you just kind of sit here and look at the sweaty guy with the beard talk. But when we sing, this is the time we're all to be engaged because the fuel to our fires, this is who God is, this is what he's done, and I won't torture you to say he did again. But here's what I want. When we sing together, I want you to blow the roof off this place with how loud you're singing. When we end a prayer and say amen, I'm not looking for the, like, amen. Like, yeah, God, you really did that. Amen. I mean that. Like, I want there to be this culture change in us because God is worthy of our praise, and you and I were created to praise. Let everything that is breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And so we're going to move into Colossians 3.16, and after that, you will get a vocal lesson. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, things are flying everywhere. So my formal education, I have two degrees. One is in Bible theology. The second degree is, they call it worship ministry. So I have a degree in music ministry. So the sum total of my very expensive piece of paper is this passage of scripture. So you know I'm going to use my expensive piece of paper to share with you. All right, Colossians 3, verse 16, it says this. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And verse 17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. All right, there's a lot to break down. There are some fancy words, teach and admonish, and I'm not going to do that. I want you to think of a vertical line and a horizontal line. I want to make this as clear as possible. Because if we're, gonna, if we're going to renew our view of what singing is in the local church, you have to understand there are two ways this works. It says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish. Can I just make this obvious? We sing to God. It says that at the second half of the verse, glorifying God with your heart. Right? I'm not teaching God anything. I'm not admonishing God about anything. Why? Because he's God. I'm learning from him. So what does that mean? The vertical aspect is with gratitude, I praise God. But the horizontal aspect of this is this. I'm teaching and admonishing you. And you're teaching and admonishing me, which means to instruct and to warn keep it as simple as possible. So when we sing together, we shouldn't just turn down the lights and crank up the speakers so you can't hear each other. In fact, one of the most powerful things you can do is when you sing out and someone looks at their left and right and you're in agreement singing truth because that means you're teaching me, you're admonishing me, you're holding me to a standard as we, church, if I can say it, as y'all, as all of us praise God together. Does this make sense? So the vertical aspect, I'm praising God. I can't teach him anything. I'm giving him glory for what he's done. This is who he is. But the horizontal aspect is this. Guess what? I have to participate. And if at any point I decide, if at any point I decide I'm not singing today, I have missed out on my opportunity to teach and admonish. Therefore, I am robbing a brother or sister in Christ an opportunity to learn something about who God is and what he's done. So I, I can clearly and strongly say to you, singing for Christians is not optional. It is a command of scripture, and it is fitting for God's people to praise him, as it says in the Psalms. I really want you to get this. And so, with that in mind, uh, here's what we're going to do. And this is going to be messy in its own way, um, but we're just going to make the most of this. All right, so stand up. 
Stand up, all of you. Look at you, look at you. Okay, so, so here's what I want to remind you. <laughs> Some of you just had your first voice lesson, uh, and that was interesting. Hey, let everything that is breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And so here's the deal. You, you warmed up your voice, you learned how to support it, and here's what we're going to do. And this is going to go one of many ways. There is a song that is very fitting for such an occasion as this. Ladies, stay where you're at. Dudes, stay where you're at. Uh, we are all familiar because we've sang it many times. It's a song called This Is Our God. And you never guess it says, this is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he's done. He saved us. And so I, all I'm going to do, you are, God's, you are God's praise him. You're God's choir. I'm a strum a guitar. I'm a Q-U-N. And you are going to sing this song, not me. Okay, we're going to make the most of this. I'm really excited for this because I want to set a new standard for you. Colossians 3.16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, gratifying God or glorifying God with a song from your heart. You are God's praise team. Some of us just so happen to, it says, praise the Lord with timbrels and dancing, with harps and cymbals, resounding cymbals, because God loves drums. But I believe this, you are God's praise team. We just happen to be line leaders when we're up here on stage, kind of leading you through the song. But let's take back what the Bible teaches. Let everything that is breath praise the Lord. No more, it's just me and Jesus or, oh, those are the music people. Nuh-uh. This is our ministry as we sing together. Sound good?